My name is uh, Jason J. Rock Houston, and you're listening to Chaotic Risk Magazine. We can be found on the web at www.chaoticrisk.com. And our special guest tonight is um, guitarist and founding member uh, Mike Flores from the band Steel City. Welcome to the show tonight, Mike. How are you doing? I'm excellent, man. How are you doing, Jason? Yeah, great things are happening for your band. And i got to tell you right off the bat, um, when I found out that you guys are signed to Paris Records, um, you, you took me back to some great um, great memories from when, you know, when I was a teenager. I remember growing up like in... Um, if you remember when they used to have rock magazines and stuff, still like Metal Edge, I get the Metal Edge, and they used to have those Paris Records ads in the back of the magazine. So, um, so I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about how you guys uh, got signed to a great little label like Paris Records. <clears throat> oh, um, sure. Uh, well, we we were on another label at one point. Okay. We yeah. on, um, a label called Kibble Records. Okay. And uh, you know, great label. They, yeah. They, they do what they do very well. There's some like, excellent melodic rock bands on that label as well. Yeah. Um, we were, you know, we were on that label for our first album, Fortress. And while we were working on our second album, um, it just, you know, time to I'm move on. To, time to move on. Yeah, just basically, time to move on. Yeah. We, do, we weren't really seeing things eye to eye creatively, and uh, you know, so they wanted a little bit more control. And yeah. you know, with me, with me, essentially, just you know, financing financing the band it's yeah. like uh, you know the end the end comes with me you know yeah. I'm, not, I'm not trying to say that disrespectfully well it makes sense I mean if you're if you're the one that's you know investing a lot of your hard in energy work and money into the band you know you want to have a little bit of you at least want to have more save in the record company I would think you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, but like I said I, I sincerely wish everyone and every band on that on that label and kibble uh, I wish them all the ultimate success. You know, it was a cool, it was a cool label, a great place to start out, and we couldn't be happier as a band uh, to be on Paris Records. Yeah. Tom Mathers, when you know, when I spoke with him, yeah. it was uh, it was cordial, and uh, it was just a, it was an amazing transition. Uh, within a day of signing, yeah. you know, within a day of signing our contract, we had one uh, our one sheet, which yeah. uh, I didn't even know what that was until I got to Paris. Yeah. Uh, had our one sheet ready to go, and he had interviews lined up and radio, uh, like radio IDs, all kinds of fun stuff ready to go, like within the first week. Oh yeah, he's, he's he's a real good guy as far as that. And um, I don't know how much you know about the um, history of Paris Records and Tom Mathers, but um, Tom Mathers, um, he actually um, he's he was a musician years ago um, in Cherry a band Street. called Cherry Street, and they had a big they had a little bit of success on the LA, um, mm -hmm. you know, metal scene. And um, he was he, he shared with me before. Um, that he'd actually start up Paris Records initially to, you know, get his own band's music out there, and then eventually it morphed into like, as you know, kind of like um, as a mail, you know, mail order um, thing where pe people would order, you know, CDs, and then he start. He eventually, um, at one point, he had um, like LA Guns on there when Jizzy Pearl was in the band, and oh, wow. um, it just it just morphed into the success that it is, and and so he's he's actually started out as a musician himself which is kind of cool you know and then he's with his label he's um helping other bands now you know <clears throat> yeah and that was you know that was one of the things i noticed you know looking on the label you know he's had a lot of different bands on there you know, heaven's edge Dirty yeah. Lips. you know there's so many uh, you know quote unquote famous and, he, and he's bands. been doing it for over th yeah, i, I want to say at least 30 to 35 years as far from what i know you know so he's got yeah. quite, quite the track record you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great dude. Yeah, uh, I always enjoy I always enjoy talking to Tom, especially about music. Yeah, and you, I know another band they had signed. I think they still do is um, he Helix, which is like a legendary uh, Canadian band. Anybody mm -hmm. heard, heard of a song like Heavy Metal Love? Um, good mm -hmm. to the last drop, but um, they have, had a lot of talent on there. Now I want to um, obviously we're talking about Steel City, which is your band, Mike, today, and um, I want to ask you a little bit about um, the history of the band, which you've already kind of told us a little bit about. But what year was the band formed, and how did uh, it come together? <clears throat> oh wow well you know um it's really kind of strange it started out as what was going to be like a solo record for me oh wow i wanted to do something i have a, another band called idora that i started with a you know a close personal friend of mine you know one of my best friends from childhood and i wanted to do something a little different and uh so i you know started out with this as a solo project and there were some songs that i had that quite honestly were just very high range and I don't have the voice for that. Yeah. Now, now let me ask you, Mike. Um, when, when, because you're a guitar player, I know. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, did you used to sing your own um, material? Or was this, like you said, start out as a solo project? So initially, was this going to be like more of a guitar instrumental album, or did it kind of morph into what it is now? 
<clears throat> no, no. Uh, our, our first album, Fortress, was going to be, you know, an album with vocals. It was the best way I can describe it is, you know, some of my, you know, my idols growing up, of course, uh -huh. Ace Fraley, uh, oh, wow. you know, John Norum, Michael Sweet, wow. uh, you know, Dave Medichetti. They're all guitar players from yeah. the same. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. And better than me, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, so I wanted to kind of follow in their footsteps and create an album somewhat like that. And, you know, when you look at albums like John Norm's Total yeah. Control, you know, he had another singer who came in yeah, and yeah. did all of did all the high songs. Yeah. And it was going to be somewhat along those same lines. And, uh, you know, initially on Fortress, we had a great mm -hmm. singer, fantastic singer. His name's Brian Cole. Wow. Um, you might know him from his own solo work, and he also was in a band called Murano. Okay. With a, with a phenomenal guitarist named Dwayne Murano, also signed Oh, yeah. Us. Actually, I, I, I've a chance to interview Dwayne a few times. He's a pretty cool guy. Yeah, he's a cool dude. Yeah, yeah. And um, so, you know, uh, Brian had sang a, a couple of songs for me, and they came back, you know, when he, when he sent them to me, they were just mm -hmm. so phenomenal. Wow. Uh, that, you know, I said, hey, do you, do you want to sing the whole album? <laughs> and he was he was gracious enough to say yes. And, uh, you know, what you heard was, you know, our first album, Fortress. And, I, you know, I had uh, a couple of guys from my hometown in Youngstown, Ohio, that backed us up on bass and on uh, drums as well. Okay, so wow. that's that's kind of like the beginnings of it. Okay, and yeah. um, and I want to ask you too because I was reading on your Facebook page that um, you know, I always love to ask people about the the name of the band because I know that's one of the hardest things to do. And I was reading on uh, your Facebook page it it said something about um, it was named after like a a steel a steel town or something. You want to uh, yeah. talk a little bit about well, that? <laughs> originally. Originally, I'm from a town called Youngstown, Ohio. Okay, yeah, I Youngstown heard Youngstown is about halfway between Cleveland and Pittsburgh, oh, wow. and that's from an area of the country that's affectionately known as the Rust Belt. Wow. Youngstown, well, Pittsburgh has always been known as the Iron City, and in oh. some regards, they call themselves the Steel City as well, simply because of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Oh, okay. Steel, okay. Steel City was the nickname given to Youngstown, Ohio. Oh, wow. So, um, I chose the name simply... Uh, more kind of, or less to pay tribute to the legacy of my town. Oh, wow, that, that's a cool thing. You don't hear people doing that too much, but um, wow. Um, and, and I got to say, you know, Steel City, um, like, um, before you even contact me, of course, like a lot of people, I started hearing a lot about your band because you guys played um, the Monster of the Rock um, cruise studios recently, and I want to talk a little bit about that because it's somewhat historical in the sense that um, a lot of bands have started doing that. It's kind of become a new thing but at the same time like i don't know if you've heard this but um it may be a trend that's not going to be taking place anymore for the simple fact that um facebook um they're coming out with some new guidelines and i think starting like october 1st it says they're not going to allow any live streaming music events um on their platform so that's kind of um an interesting thing but you, you guys had this thing you got to take part in and oh my gosh so i mean wow. <laughs> just think about that for a minute you know <laughs> Well, that's pretty amazing, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, again, you know, I can't thank, you know, Larry Morand and the yeah. Monsters of Rock Cruise team yeah. enough for, you know, you know, being so gracious as to invite us on there. I mean, um, the, the whole experience was absolutely fantastic, yeah. and, uh, you know, we had a blast doing it. It was, you know, and it's a little scary because you're thinking, oh my gosh, you know, the whole time you're like, this is Monsters of Rock, so, you, yeah. know, you know, there's a there's a little bit of a tingle there, you know, you know, and, but... Once we started, we got going. Uh, the vibe was just so good with the band, and we, we had an absolute blast. And Joe Schaefer, uh, the photographer, yeah. took some amazing pictures, and I've been posting those online. Oh well, as well. Yeah, and I got to ask you, um, how did how did the event? Um, how did you get able to take part in the event? Did did, did uh, Monsters of Rock people reach out to you? Was it your record label reaching out to them, or a little both? Well, you know, <laughs> I guess this is this is a great time to start uh, the introduction to the band. Uh huh. You know, our, ba our new bass player, for, you know, that came aboard for Mach 2, his name is Jason Cornwell. He's a, you know, killer bass player, as you've okay. probably seen on the live stream. Okay. Uh, he used to play with Eric Martin, I guess, at one point. Oh, okay. yeah, Mr. Big, okay. <laughs> wow. yeah. yeah. He has a, you know, he has a good relationship with the people at Monsters of Rock, and uh, I think, you know, with his other band, he has a band called Westbound. Okay. They, wow. had, been, had, a, they had done the show, and I think he, you know, mentioned it to Monsters of Rock at that time, said, mm -hmm. hey, you know, would you consider uh, yeah. my other band? And I don't know from I don't know where it trans you know yeah. how it transpired from that point on, but I think the initial um, that was the seed that got planted. <laughs> so yeah, to speak. The initial seed was planted by Jason. Well, wow, makes sense. So yeah. if I can, yeah. I'd like to take a moment to introduce you know to talk about the band. Okay, sure, sure. Um, because you know for this record, it was one of those things where you know Brian, like I said, as incredible as a singer he as he is, 
uh, he kind of wanted to move on, and I think he really wanted to focus on his solo stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, also he really found a great home in Murano. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. I mean, and like I said, my favorite song on Murano's album, by the way, is Cookie Jar, which is a song <laughs> Brian sings. Oh, wow, wow, yeah. But, um, you know, so he was ready to move on. And then, unfortunately for me, the two guys that I'm tight with from Youngstown, Ohio, they were kind of a package deal. And the one, one gentleman, Scott West, had gotten elevated to president of the company that he worked for. So oh, they wow. kind of bounced at the same time. Yeah. Got to make a living, huh? Yeah. Required a new band. Because yeah. the, the only people that were left were me and my keyboard player, Tony Stahl. Okay. So, um, you know, Jason was recruited. Um, and then, uh, of course, I got a call from... You know, and this all happened, you know, at the, at the behest of our old label, yeah, uh, Kibble yeah. Records. Okay. He kind of set up, he set up the, the interviews, so to speak, for me to, to kind of sell these guys on being in, um, in the band. Still City. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we talked with BJ, BJ Zampa, um, yeah. about uh, playing drums, and, you know, he was on board from the beginning, as was Jason. Um, and then I got a call from Roy Cathy. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, Cold Sweat, and it was just like one of those things where we talked about how we, you know... He, you know, really had a lot of tough questions for me. He mm-hmm. wanted to know what he expected of him, what the album was going to mm-hmm. sound like, what the influences were, where yeah. we wanted to take this album. Um, and, you know, he's got quite a different vocal approach than Brian. Okay. And, you know, Roy is outer worldly as well. You know, I think yeah. I've been very fortunate and blessed to, to probably play with two of the best singers in melodic rock today. Yeah, I mean, and, like, like um, uh, you know, Cold, uh, um, uh, um, you know, the band you said he was in... Um, I know Cold that was sweat. Cold Sweat with Mark Ferrari, and see, mm-hmm. so he's one of those guys that, um, you know, he, he didn't have a huge breakup, but he almost kind of, you know, had that chance, and people people on the hard rock scene, they've heard the name, they know a little bit about who he is, now maybe his exposure is going to go up just that much more, so he's probably one of those guys like, I came real close once before, I want to make sure to do it right, you know, the second time around. <laughs> Uh, it's, it, you know, I hope Roy doesn't get too mad, but we all, he always jokes. It's actually his joke. He's yeah. like, you know, man, I'm the most famous unknown singer in town. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I just We kind of chuckle about it a little bit, but Roy is a fantastic talent. Yeah. And once he found out, you know, what, you know, that we were kind of on the same page yeah. as to where we wanted this to go, because we all wanted, like, we love the Fortress album, but we wanted a bit of a different sound for this. Yeah. And he was totally on board once he heard that, you know, I wanted to be a little bit more aggressive in, in our sound. And, you know, I wanted kind of a more guttural approach to the singing, which I think he did fantastic. So now let, let me ask you about the band you're talking about right now as we sit here and speak. Um, are these the guys that played on the album, or is this kind mm-hmm. of a band? Oh, from- yeah. Oh, great. No, this is the band that played on the album. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's these, cool. these guys played on the album. You know, BJ played on the mm-hmm. album. Roy sang on the album. Jason's there. Tony, of course, laid down some beautiful keyboards. Yeah. And uh, it was kind of funny. We joked a little, a little yeah. bit about it, too, because the album without keyboards, yeah. there are some songs that straight up sound like Skid Row. And then you throw the keyboards on, and you're like, oh, yeah, these yeah, guys yeah, yeah, sound yeah. like Bon Jovi or Europe. Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that, because um, I hear a lot of people, you know, Always saying like keyboards suck in music. I I tend to disagree. I mean, um, I could come up with a couple examples. Like you mentioned, Bon Jovi, Europe. Um, uh, example I really love to go throw out there is um, Deep Purple. Okay, you, you listen to anything, uh, especially you know those classic Deep Purple albums from the seventies. You listen to anything John Lord did, and, and then you tell me the keyboards don't belong in rock music. You know that's kind of what I say. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'm I'm one of those guys. I love a good heavy guitar album. Yeah. I love guitar-driven yeah. rock. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But when Tony and I were sitting down to talk about the keyboards for this 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 yeah. album, we yeah. we kind of both arrived at the same point. He said, "What are you thinking of?" And I said, yeah. "Well, have you heard a lot of the new Europe?" And he's like, "Yeah, it sounds a lot like Deep Purple." I said, "Exactly." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> and so he's like, "So that he goes, we're talking about the same thing. We're talking like a lot of Hammond and stuff." I said, "Absolutely." Oh wow, that's yeah, that, that, so, that's funny. But you know, and, and even another uh, great band from the seventies I could point to is, um, and, and it was really a guitar-driven band was um, Boston. I'm not sure if you know who they are, but a great band. Boston? From the, yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> More than a feeling. Yeah. That's the band you, I'm talking about. Their, yeah. <laughs> their debut album to me, still being their played. Debut album is still the best debut album of yeah. all time. Oh yeah, I mean, it's still. I don't being, think there's anyone that's better. And, and that's the guy that I don't. He, uh, Tom Scholz, um, you know, the, the main guy in Boston. Uh, mm-hmm. He's a guy that in, in that thing called the Rock Man, the guitar players. I don't know if you've ever seen those. I or, have one. Oh, cool! <laughs> wow. So you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. And, and even um, you talk about you know g- guitar players and that from the '80s. I mean, even a guy like uh, Eddie Van Halen. You go back to you know Jump or even the whole Sammy Hagar era of the band. 
and they incorporate keyboards into their music. <clears throat> they sure do. Yeah, and, and you know when I listen to um, you know bands, one of the one of my favorite bands that really you know aside from like Europe, like yeah, I said, yeah. um, I really love what you know White Snake does with keys. I oh really, yeah. You know, I really dig what what Winger did with their keys, and that like again, those were like I said the type type of vibes we were going for. We wanted to have you know that kind of sound i mean the music that i write is probably more 70s driven yeah, yeah. but by the time by the time we you know get through production it has it's 70s rock with i guess a bit of an 80s flair as that's a, definitely what i hear and, and and i'll tell you when i listen to your album um i kind of um after i heard i uh, listened to the whole thing i kind of got thinking okay this band you know uh, it's kind of a cross between um bon jovi and van halen that's just you know to my ears but um mm -hmm. kind of like you said a big 80s rock sounding band with some 70s in it, uh, you know, influence. Um, but, but you know, that, that's not a bad thing because that's obviously what you grew up on. And, and it, I'm, it's interesting that you mention a band like um, Europe because they're, they're a great band, you know, to me too, but they're one of those bands that kind of, um, they don't get a lot of love these days, you know what I mean? And people refer them to, to them as like a one-hit wonder. They think all they ever did was the final countdown, you know, but there's much yeah. more depth to what they did. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. You know, they, they had, you know, so many more hits than the final countdown. But aside from that, yeah. I mean, when you just look at the musical talent that's in that band, uh, they're just, you know, they're something to behold. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And, and I mean, just, just think about that for a minute. I mean, people kind of knock, that's one band people kind of knock on, you know, like they did on Winger back in the day. But, but even Winger, that's a band of great musicians. I mean, um, oh, yeah. You know, um, absolutely. And, and just Red Beach, you look at all the bands he's played in, White Snake and. Dawkins and, and um, even your drummer, BJ Zampa. You and me were kind of talking a little bit about him over the, you know, right. through, through email. And um, he he's very much you know like your singer Roy Cathy. He's he's a guy that's kind of been around and he's starting to. I mean, um, like of all the guys in the band, BJ Zampa. I know. Okay, he plays in your band. He plays in um, he plays with House of Lords. He plays with uh, Dawkins now. So I mean, that guy he he's got a real he's his calendar. I bet is full. You know. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And you know what, though? You know, as, as many bands as he's in, yeah. and, you know, being, you know, the guy with his rock star status, yeah. you know, he is uh, probably, what, you know, when you talk to him, he's one of the nicest guys in the world. Oh, yeah, I bet. Yeah. And, and I was curious, like, um, the Monsters of Rock um, show you guys did, I, um, I was reading on the Facebook page that I, I think you had a different drummer filling in, but that's probably just because he was busy with one of his other bands. Uh, you know, it's... It may be, but, you know, it was more of, you know, I reached out to DJ and to mm -hmm. Tony yeah. when, you know, the Monsters of Rock thing, you know, when the offer was coming up. And they were both, you know, they both wanted to do it pretty badly. Yeah. The only the only holdback for them was, you know, they, they live in New York and oh. Connecticut. Wow. Well, and so, yeah, that's a bit of a... They issue. would have had to quarantine for 14 days coming back. And that would have been a strain, not only on them, but it would have been a strain on their families yeah, as well. Yeah, of course, so of course. We, with that in mind... You know, both were kind of gracious, and they said, "Hey, look, you know, take the gig." And you know, if you get, and so you know, we were fortunate. Again, Jason, being you know the magician that he is, he knows everybody. <laughs> wow, wow. And uh, he, he, you know, I found I found the keyboard player Adam through a good friend of mine in, in Los Angeles named Electra Baracos. She's an amazing solo artist herself. Wow. wow. Um, so I found Adam Perry through her, and then um, of course Derek Pontier was a touring drummer for Great White for a while, for Jack Russell's Great oh, wow, White. Wow. I think he even appeared on an album with them, if I'm not mistaken. But okay. he's, you know, good friends with Jason. And, you know, so Jay reached out and said, hey, would you like to do the Monsters of Rock thing? And on short notice, these guys came in and knocked it out of the park. I mean, it was a blast playing with them. Yeah, and I got to so, ask you, what was that experience you know, like as far as, right? as far as, um, you know, the show with the Monsters of Rock? What was the show like? Because I've heard people that have done it, and they tell me, you know, you're, you're not really an audience there. You're kind of just playing to an empty room. So, first of all, as a guy that's used to, you know, performing live, what was that? That Did that take any getting used to, or did you kind of just adjust right away? <laughs> well, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't done a ton of live shows since returning to, uh, oh. since returning to the stage in 2018. Okay. However, I will tell you this much. <laughs> I mean, we love playing live. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. And the one thing that I've, you know, that I was told, and my, you know, my dad told me this when I was a younger man, you know, cover bands in high yeah, school yeah. right out of high school and whatnot he's like does it matter if you're playing to five people 500 5,000 he's like your performance is the same every mm -hmm. night and you know when we walked out on that stage I think the biggest you know we all 
you kind of lose the idea, you know, after, Just, how can I say this? After, you know, after the first song, you yeah. know, or so after the few, you know, few bars of the first yeah. song, you kind of lose the fact that there's not an audience there because all you can really see in front of you is, mm. uh, you know, perhaps lights from the camera that are shooting at you. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, they're, they're shooting you, so you really can't see that there's, you know, virtually nobody there. Yeah, um, yeah. So it, it, you just, and you're just out on a stage, almost like you're in band practice, yeah. jamming and having fun. The only thing, the scariest part about it for all of us, I think, is we're like looking around at the stage, we're like, this is so damn awesome. <laughs> you, yeah. kind of, you kind of get lost in the moment. <laughs> and, you know, you, you really get lost in the moment because it's such a fun time with that, you know, with that amazing stage with all that LED, with those LED lights and all yeah, that yeah. stuff and the production itself just sounded so amazing. And you know, um, in fact, so it, it, would you say it didn't would, really matter? Would you say though that's maybe the biggest stage you guys have played on, or have you played on bigger stages? Um, as far as the size of the stage, yeah, I guess, yeah, that's yeah. I don't know. I'd say this, the stage that we played at at New England Rock Fest is very similar in size uh, to the stage, but as far as like the beauty of the stage, yeah. and the magnitude of what you know of what it is, that's definitely the coolest stage yeah. we've we've played on for sure by. Bar. And I would think that probably the most different thing about performing um, at an event like that is the fact that you don't like um, have a live audience to kind of feed off the roar of a crowd. <laughs> you know, again, it, the one thing I can say though is yeah. we didn't have the audience to feed off of. Yeah. But the cool thing was is we were able to feed off, you know, feed off the energy from each other. Yeah, and, and I think that, that makes them like that that much more special because um, this is kind of like the first time you guys are, you know, a lot of people are seeing events like this. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so for you to kind of go in there and just kind of, it's your first time doing it, you, you, it did come off, you know, as a real professional looking gig. You know, I will tell you somebody that's, um, saw some of the clips from it. I mean, um, and, and I, I dare say that I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can attest to this, that, um, probably since that one performance, the, the band has been getting a lot more, um, just even hits on social media and um, a lot more attention previous to the gig. Would that be a fair statement? Um, I think it would because there's um, a very long list. I, I have to go through it actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of, of friend requests since yeah. that show, um, and I, I have to go through that. But uh, we've gotten that. We've gotten more hits on Spotify. We've gotten you know uh, more likes on our Facebook mm -hmm. page, more traffic to the web page, all of that stuff. And I just want to say thank you to you know all the people that tuned in because that's really special for us. Uh, to see, you know, I think at the last the last count that I saw was like over eighty five hundred views of the of the uh, of the live stream, and for me, it's mm -hmm. like it's kind of mind boggling. But I want to thank all the people yeah. who tuned in, anybody that you know, and of course, anybody that picked up any merchandise from you know Monsters of Rock because that helps their crew and it helps the band too. So yeah, well, you know, and again, really like, like you said, you know, Monsters of Rock, from what I know, you know, before, of course, it was um, known primarily as you know. They do their, crew, their Monsters of Rock crews once a year, and people mm -hmm. have gone that. And um, and you, if you watch any video clips from any of those um, cruises they had over the years, they were monster performances. But but I, I, I dig the fact that the Monsters of Rock organization, they're not able to go out and do the cruise right now. So they've kind of created a new kind of way of doing things. And um, you got you to gotta give them props for that because they're like one of the um, first organizations to find a way to kind of get bands out there to, uh, you know, you might not have a live uh, audience to feed up, but they found a way to do it. You, you got to love that. Well, yeah, and, you know, you, when you think about that, you think about what Larry Moran and his his staff are doing. Yeah. It's, you know, they you know they had a cruise set up, ready to go, yeah. killer bands online, and it all falls apart. So what they could do nothing. Yeah, yeah. Or they could do something, and what they've done is they've created an avenue and an outlet for their fans to at least enjoy some live music. I mean, you know, it's still a live show. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, and it, it's it's amazing what they've done, and they and not only are they you know just putting a live show on, yeah. on for for their for their fans, mm -hmm. they're you know they're giving the fans a great experience by you know with that stage. You know, it's it's like you're going to see a major concert. You might as well be in a twenty thousand seat arena yeah. looking at a stage like that. And then then the other beautiful part about it is. Um you know, people, they, they can watch it from the comfort of their own home. They don't have to, yeah. you know, leave, leave the house. And there, there's that, you know. Um, oh, exactly. I've had people, you know, texting me, you know, on Facebook. You're going to do the next uh, one? Yeah. That have said, hey, dude, I'm watching this on my break at work. It's, you know, it's friggin' awesome. I love it. And, 
you know, it, it just makes you feel good because it, you know it, for not you know, not only for your band but like i said yeah. it was such an opportunity with such a big name like monsters of rock I me mean, dude we're all just you know we, i can't tell you how humble the band felt just to even be there i mean i mean so, you, you guys are um one of the more newer up and coming bands because they've had bands like um you know terry lewis used to be the singer in xyz and great white mm -hmm. they had jack right. russell from great white they, they did a performance together they had mm -hmm. bands like pretty boy floyd i think frank hannon and some of the bands he's producing these days um you know from tesla so oh yeah we, um, bumped, into, we bumped into the guys from kingdom come when we were at the studio i mean it was amazing yeah. and kingdom you know? come that's that's an amazing you know story right there i know the singer um keith st john and he used to uh, right. sing with ronnie montrose and he's got his own band now burning rain but um He's not even the original wow. singer of yeah. Kingdom Come, and they've kind of had a, they've kind of gone back together with him and uh, the, all the other original guys, and he's taken Lenny Wolf's place. But um, it, it's amazing. Yeah, a nice little resurgence. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. You know, um, and they haven't even re released any new music with uh, Keith St. John yet, but I think that's something they're working towards. And, I'm sure. I'm sure they will, and you know yeah. he's he's one hell, hell of a singer, so yeah. I'm sure it'll be fantastic whatever they yeah. come up with. And again, I, I don't know I don't know what your ages, but I, I remember King Kingdom Come, the original band, first came out like um, around 1987 or 88, and they went on that Monsters of Rock cruise with Van Halen and the Scorpions. I mean, they came with that song, uh, you know, Get It On, and people started ragging them. Oh, especially uh, like uh, Robert Plant, he's saying, oh. You know, they're, they're Led Zeppelin copy copy band and this and that. And they got so ragged on for that. But, um, uh, but you, you like know, I man, said... Well, here's the thing. Yeah, yeah. There's, only, there's only so many notes you can play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, when people say that kind of yeah. you know, that kind of stuff, it's really, you know, I, I don't want to get too negative, but no, it's kind no. of a turn off for me because yeah, we're yeah. all going to sound like somebody. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I, for instance, you know, somebody... I've had a couple people tell me, and it's funny, it's the same... Same, uh, I consider a compliment. Yeah, they yeah. said you sound like Neil Sean on steroids. Okay, so apparently, yeah, well, yeah. there's some Neil Sean in my guitar playing. Well, that's I, so, uh, I, was, I, uh, I might sound like Neil Sean on yeah. one record. I might sound like Ace yeah. Frehley on her next because those are influences. Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. it's disheartening when people say things like that because we all have influences. Well, they're I mean, all going to yeah. reflect their. Music. I mean, even Robert Plant. There, there, there were bands like before Led Zeppelin. You know that he. That he kind of borrowed from so everybody's got their yeah. influences you know you know and, you, everybody comes from somewhere man yeah and it's interesting and um you, you talk about ace Frehley because i'm a huge kiss fan and i kind of i was kind of interested since um you mentioned ace as one of your influences how excited are you about his album coming it's a it's an all covers album origins too but um are you, are you excited to check that out when it comes out next week you know what i'll definitely check it out uh he's got a killer band behind yeah. him yeah he's got matt star on drums and, yeah. you know that band is incredible i'll definitely check it out I like. I'd love to hear another Rich, original Rich. album from yeah. Ace, but yeah. you know, if he's coming out with covers, dude, I'll take covers too. That's just that's what fine. he's that's what he's known for. But you know, because um, his first big hit was like, of course, New York Groove, and right. um, that's part I think of his record. In fact, he just signed a new uh, three record uh, three. It's with the same record company, but um, but like a three record deal. So the next one is yeah. going to be an original. So we do have that to look forward, but. Um, it's just something cool to have, something new from Ace Frehley, whatever it may be. Because, you know, the, the unique thing about Ace Frehley, if you're at all a Kiss fan, is um, back in the early days of Kiss, he used to, um, all the songs he would write, like early, like around 74, 75, he'd usually give his songs to either um, Gene or Peter to sing, because he didn't think he was a, you know, he wasn't confident enough about his singing back then. And, um, of course, as you know, as a Kiss fan, it wasn't until 1977 when they put out Love Gun that he, did the song shock me and he became more confident um in his ability as a singer <clears throat> yeah yeah that's it that's probably one of my favorite kiss songs of all time yeah, yeah. My, uh, one of my cover bands in high school actually or right out of high school used to play that that was like our big you know yeah. and then of course i, I yeah. you know did my best to replicate ace's solo from alive to and all that yeah. <laughs> it was a good time um like i said he's probably my first and biggest influence and I, other than that at the Two guys from Europe, John Norm and Key Marcello, yeah. uh, Red, Red Beach. Those are the guys that I kind of, you know, that kind of I gravitate towards, gravitated towards later and even more so now. Yeah, yeah. Just, I love their play. Yeah, you know, um, John Norm, he, he's an interesting cat. I mean, I loved his playing, of course, original guitar player from Europe. He went back, you know, and Key Marcello, as you say, he's a guy who replaced him. But, um, you know, John, John Norm eventually went back. But I don't know if you, um, he played on one of um, Don Dawkins' solo albums. I don't know if you've, know that at all but um he actually played on he played on a docking album too yeah that's as the, well. yeah that's one uh it, yeah 
So he yeah, played on Don Dawkins' solo album. Then there was an album. I'm trying to remember which which one it was. Right off the top of my head, I can't remember. But he played on an actual Dawkins album. Yeah, because well. I think it was called Up from the Ashes, and and that yeah. was that was when um, they had Mickey D on drums, of course, from Motorhead and the Scorpions. Yeah. Now, so um, you know, he was kind of for a while uh, Don Dawkins' go-to guy, and, he, and even. Um, while we're talking about Dawkins, you know, you mentioned Red Beach. He, he did a Dawkins album too, <laughs> Erase the Slate. That's actually, Erase the Slate is actually my favorite Dawkins album of all time. Yeah. I know that's probably sacrilege to people who love the original lineup or the uh, classic lineup, as yeah. it's called. But, you know, for sure, yeah. without a doubt, the, the Red Beach album is my favorite. Uh, that, and uh, yeah. the funny thing about John Norum, I met, uh, I met the band when they played here in Los Angeles. I don't know if you remember when they played here. I think it was 2015 or uh -huh. 2016. They played the Saban. I did like the little VIP package, and uh, Norum wasn't, he wasn't uh, actually at the VIP, and the whole band signed my guitar, their manager brought the guitar back to, you know, for John to sign, Wow! and then, lo and behold, I met one of the manager's best friends, <laughs> while I was, you know, you know, waiting for the concert to yeah, start, yeah. the guy gave, he, the guy gave my wife and I his backstage passes, so I had my 30 second brush with John Norum, and for me it was like... It was like having to meet John and wow. Jimmy Tempest and Nick McKaylee. I mean, it was it was really cool. Well, wow, that, that that that's a great that's and a great I, story, you know. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yep. And you know, and I got to meet Jeff Scott yeah. Soto that day too because he's oh, wow. backstage as well. And you know, Red Beach, you know, um, he's been in all the great bands, Winger, and even Alice Cooper, briefly, um, mm -hmm. White Snake, and um, I don't know if you're aware of this because um, I forget what's I think um, it's called Masquerade. He even put out a solo album a number of years ago where he mm -hmm. he wrote everything and he sang so. Um, he, he's like the triple threat, you know, he can do it all, he can sing, he can write, and I think, besides being a great guitar player, that's, that's a lot of his success is being a great, um, songwriter, that's why people can, you know, laugh and scock all they want about Winger, but Winger really is a great band, I mean, um, especially well, if you go back to that, those first two albums, they got a truckload of hits, you know? <laughs> well, that's the thing, that, you know, a lot of, a lot of guitar players can riff, yeah, yeah. and there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with being yeah. that guy. Yeah. Because everybody needs someone who can, you know, you know, play, you know, play a beautiful guitar solo or come up with a killer riff. Yeah. But, you know, one of the things I can say, you know, maybe much like Rev Beach, I yeah. actually take greater pride in being able to write because the Steel City, you know, when the yeah. last two Steel City albums, the first two Eldora albums, you know, with the exception of whatever covers might have been on the album yeah. I wrote. And so I take greater pride in actually being a songwriter. Yeah. And than I do actually being a guitar player. And the best part about all of that, mm -hmm. you know, to circling back to the city, yeah. is giving all of the guys, you know, to, you know, making it, you know, really feel like a band. Yeah. Every single one of these guys, when they step into the studio, yeah. has free license to do whatever they want. Wow. And, you know, because I want them, you know, just to feel like, like to feel yeah. as passionate about the music as I do. And yeah. that, that's what makes the music, I think that's what makes it kind of, you know, I, not just, yeah. not, at the risk of sounding arrogant, I think that's what makes it stand out because everybody is invested. Oh yeah, and I'll tell I'll tell you this: like all these great bands that we've been mentioning, you know, um, Kiss and Winger and Alice Cooper and all these other bands, the thing that made those bands really great, or um, you know, besides putting on great, you know, great live events, is um, they had the songs. I mean, you take a band like Kiss. Okay, Gene and Paul have been running that band for for 50 years, close to it now. And um, mm -hmm. the reason that y you can say what you want about their musicianship. But they are some great songwriters. I mean, look at the catalog of music they have. I mean, you hear more than just rock and roll all night every day. I mean, they have stuff as diverse from rock and roll all night to forever, you know, and Beth and Sure Knows Something or I Was Made for Loving You. Um, they got a ton of hits, so you really can't argue with that kind of success. And, um, and the other thing about it is, if you got songs like that, you're going to, you know, people are going to remember you. You're going to have a, you're going to have a legacy, you know. And, and uh, I mean, even a band like Motley Crue, I was recently reading, I don't really quite understand why he would do it because I know he doesn't need the money, but Nikki Six recently sold all the rights to all the, you know, to the Motley Crue catalog. But um, that's another wow. guy. Look, look at, you know, look at all the hit songs he wrote. And, and that, and, um, you know, Motley Crue, that's what they're remembered for is their songs. <clears throat> and that's the thing is, you know, you know, you always have to remember that the whole is going to be greater than the sum, you know, yeah. some of the parts. Yeah. And Kiss to me has yeah. always been a band that kind of gets dog their musicianship. Yeah. But when you listen to a lot of them, you, know, yeah. you listen to it. To yeah. me, they have their musicianship for what they do is stellar. You oh, don't yeah. have to have, 
you know, King Vey Malmsteen, yeah. you know, and I, I like King Vey's play. Yeah, 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 I yeah. think he's fantastic, and I, yeah. you know, I'd love to meet the guy. Yeah. But you don't have to have somebody like that come over, come in and glaze over a solo on a song like I Was Made For Love. Yeah, yeah. It, and, it just, you do, you pl they play what fits, and yeah, they do and, it very well. And, and, and you know, know, I the, wish yeah. that, you know, yeah. Yeah. hey, I'd love to be, be around in the 80s just to, you know. See what they were doing, yeah. Yeah, do what they were doing, but you know, the nice thing is, as a songwriter, when you listen to bands like yeah. Kiss, and you listen to bands like Wayne or Journey, yeah. all these bands that have, you know, top yeah. shelf songwriters, yeah. um, you know, you can learn, you, you, whether you're, you know, That's, touring with them or yeah. just listening to on an album, you're learning from them. Oh yeah, I mean, that, you're, yeah. you're drawing from that experience, and, it's, yeah. it, and it shows. I mean, perfect example of that is like, um, you look at Kip Winger, I mean, um, as most people know, he started out um, professionally as a bass player for Alice Cooper's band back in 1986. Back then, nobody knew, um, you know, the guy was a singer, a songwriter, or, but he would do what he did in Winger, but, um, you know, like he, like he said, okay, he wanted to get his, um, he, you know, he wanted to uh, get, get a professional career going, and if that's, and first of all, think about that, that that's, you know, one of the first things you do is, bass player for Alice Cooper's, you know, touring band. I mean, um, and you get to make some albums with him. That, that's a great, you know, that's a great start right there. And then a few years later, you get a, you know, you get offered a record deal and you got your own band and you're the lead singer and people are finally going to get to hear, hear songs you wrote. I mean, I mean, like, like you said, um, he, he yeah. jumped at the chance, you know, why not? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, Absolutely. And I got to say, you know, Mike, like, like you said, you started out as a guitar player and you, you could have taken the typical route i know i'm just gonna put out instrumental music there's nothing wrong with that but like i i always um unless like you're a joe satriana steve Vai, you know and and all the songs sound drastically different than the one previous um a lot of those albums you know like 10 tracks that sound the same so to me if you're gonna put out instrumental music you know you got to be really kind of um you know different because a lot, a lot of those a lot of those albums sound the same you know so um and then and, and I, I i have respect for guys that do that there's a certain art to it you know um one of my favorite guys is this guy michael angelo beto i mean he he's a great instrumentalist um mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so there are guys out there that um you, you know can do that but but i i've also i've always been kind of a bigger fan of guys that can um you know write music like tell us like like you said you, you write most of his songs for steel city so you know you're you're not the lead singer but you're 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 writing the music you're writing the songs you're involved with the lyrics you're kind of telling the story and, and i i think that that is you know takes a super amount of talent to be able to do that <coughs> well thank you yeah that's that's very kind to say uh like you mm -hmm. i can take instrumental music mm -hmm. but only in small doses yeah 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 uh, and you know and that's not again that's not to discredit no no because there's a talent because, for you know, people that the guys do. that you yeah. mentioned yeah. would play circles around me all day every day and yeah. twice on yeah. sunday yeah. but to me it's like i really enjoy that's one of the things probably you know why i gravitated to uh, honestly, you know, and it's like my my friends tease the hell out of me because I'm like a John Norm fanboy. Wow. But um, they tease me about it. But that's why I was gravitated. Why I gravitated so much to his music because you know the guy can sing. Yeah. He plays. He's, he's an yeah. excellent songwriter. Yeah. And you know he still throws. No, I you know I don't think I'll be throwing any instrumentals. Yeah. I I put, put one on an album. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, I don't think I'll be putting any, any instrumentals on an album anytime soon. But the ones he puts on there are tasteful. Yeah, yeah. All different. And so it really kind of adds character to his albums. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one thing I love about John Norm is um, he just a really gifted cat. I mean, in Europe, he's just kind of doing this guitar thing, but um, on his solo albums, he can sing. He, you know, he writes everything. He, he plays the guitar beautifully. Mm -hmm. You know, another guy like that is, um, you know, Richie Kotzen, which, which is kind of interesting oh my gosh. because you know when he started out, like when he, he I don't know, he like seventeen or eighteen, he was a young, young kid when he used yeah. to do those records on Shrapnel Records. I don't know if you remember those but like um i mean the guy was a shredder and then and then a few years later we find out, oh he's got this beautiful voice and he uh, even like with the winery dogs and when, when he was in poison and did that album you know the background vocals he did with brett michaels it's just amazing and i'm like wow this this guy can sing too <laughs> why was he singing before yeah. you know uh -huh. yeah very soulful voice the winery dogs are strong guy. yeah i mean he almost sounds you know if, if, if you didn't know who richie costin was and you just listened to the voice you'd almost think it was an R&B B singer, you know, he's got, he's a very versatile singer, but, so, so I got to give him, um, kudos for what he does, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah, and, um, so, um, 
I guess the main thing like we've been talking about is the performance you did at the Monster to Rock. So um, I'm sure with COVID-19, you know, like a lot of people, you're not able to play um, live right now. So what, what's the plans as far as um, promoting the record? Well, you know, uh, the record came out in March. Okay. And uh, so, you know, it was promoted very heavily by uh, Paris Records. Yeah, which they Adams, do a great which, job of. And yeah. by the band, of course. Okay. And uh, so that, you know, that was a, you know, I, I don't want to say that it's run its course because I don't believe it has. Or, no, no. You know, yeah. you know, we wouldn't have been fortunate enough to do Monsters Rock. Yeah. But the plan is just to, you know, keep the record on everybody, you know, in everybody's ears. Uh -huh. You know, perhaps release another, perhaps release another lyric video. Uh -huh. But, uh, you know, and when we get back to live playing, you know, we just make sure that we get some solid, <laughs> solid shows that really kind of mm -hmm. can bring awareness to the band. We're very fortunate that we, you know, we've mm -hmm. um, we signed a, a deal with Brad Lee Entertainment, and Brad always has some really signature. He has some signature mm -hmm. events throughout the country, and we we're going to be very fortunate to be a part of a lot of those as they come as they mm -hmm. come around. You know, sooner or later, the COVID thing's got it. Back. Yeah, it's got to. I mean, yeah. And at that point, you know, we're all going to be getting back out. Hopefully, we'll be able to catch on. Yeah. You know, maybe play some, play some key shows as well with with some you know major artists. But we'll see what happens when yeah. all of that. And, you know, the amazing thing to me, like you said, the album came out in March, and and I hadn't really um, heard too much about the band until you guys um, got that got that gig with the Monsters of Rock, but, but hey, whatever it takes, you know, and, um, I mean, because you just think about this, I mean, you look at your own story, uh, Mike, but, um, like, how many great bands are out there that nobody's ever heard of, and all of a sudden, just, you know, one person on the, plays a song on the radio, and it starts to get traction, I mean, um, you guys are, you know, you're, you're just in the beginning stages, but, you, you know, pe people are starting to hear about your band, that, that's a, you know, that, that's a great thing, it can hopefully, um, you know, things only get better for you from from, from this point. But I was curious. Um, but the album's called Mach Two. Now, when I hear Mach Two, I'm, I'm assuming that that's because, like you said, this isn't the original lineup of the band. This is the band kind of now. When I think of Mach Two, though, I remember they used to call like um, Deep Purple when um, um, you know when Glenn Hughes and David Coverdale came into the band. They called that, I think, Mach Two or something like that. So, um, well, what it was, <laughs> it, it, you're, you're you're definitely correct. Yeah. Because this isn't the original lineup of the band. Yeah. Uh, you know, we and we felt like we felt the songs on uh -huh. this record yeah. uh, really kind of brought the band, you know, up a level or two. Yeah, and we we definitely felt the personnel also did the same. It was a shift in our sound. Uh -huh. With all of those things happening, Mach Two just felt like a natural progression, um, if you will, progression and, and a great name for the album. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, you know, there was a couple of different ways we were looking at it as going as far as like the artwork, uh -huh. and ultimately. <laughs> I kind of won. Oh, <laughs> and, oh um, yeah, there you go. We went with like the SR seventy one Blackbird on the on the front cover, and our artist Nello Delomo, who does a lot of work for uh, for Frontiers Records, he's done a lot for Melodic Rock Records, Kibble Records. I mean, you Paris. I mean, his his, his artwork is everywhere. He wow. did a fantastic job. Wow, that's great. And you know, we, we love the guy, and we can't wait to you know work together with him again on mm. the next album. And let me ask you, so. But um, when you guys got in the recording studio with the current lineup, um, mm -hmm. were, were a lot of these songs, I'm assuming, already written um, before this version of the band came together? And, and um, you know, what was that process like? Um, did the new singer, for example, did he have to kind of get comfortable with the material? Did you allow him to kind of put his own spin on it? <clears throat> oh, absolutely. When, you know, when Roy and I were talking about, you know, the album, well, let me, let me ask the first party question. I'm yeah. so sorry. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, the, the songs were written. Okay. And uh, it was, you know, at, at that point, we were still on the old label. Uh -huh. And uh, it was kind of between the old label, uh, Tony Stahl, our keyboard player, and mm -hmm. myself. We were kind of like, you know, cruising through the songs and choosing the ones that we felt were the best. Once we found the 10 that we, you know, that we felt comfortable with using, um, what we then did, because I do all the demos, I have a home mm -hmm. studio. Oh, great. And so what we did is we essentially just stripped everything down except my guitars okay. and then it was sent to bj who was you know again yeah. given carte blanche and you know the ultimate freedom to do whatever he wanted on drums wow from there from there it went to jason yeah. from jason it went to roy and then from roy back to tony to lay down the keys wow and um all of those guys were given you know carte blanche to do whatever they wanted and um they, and you hear the end result and I, I'd be remiss if I did not also include Eric Johnson 
um, from Bombay, a band called Bombay Black. Oh, wow. Uh, I've heard of them. He, yeah. Uh, Eric did the overwhelming bulk of the backing vocals on the album. Wow. And again, had free reign to, you know, to do whatever mm. he wished. Most of the stuff, you know, that, you know, came, that he did, kind of mm. fell within very closely to what, you know, was on the original demos, but there were some songs where he just really kind of shifted things, you know, quite a bit, like, for instance, Spotlight. Oh, wow. The backgrounds on Spotlight was something that he shifted completely, changed the dynamic of the song. Not not only did it change the dynamic of the song, it elevated the quality of the song completely. Mm. Just things like that. Wow, wow. And, you know, of course, Roy was given, you know, freedom to change change things as he felt fit. If the words that mm-hmm. he wanted to come up with felt like there was a little bit better of a flow, uh. he was always welcome to do that. And that's, like I said, that's the key, is just to make sure everybody feels like they just have, you know, they have their say, and th- so they can feel like the album. And I, like think the as a, I think as a singer, too, um, you know, that, that's, um, that takes... I'm sorry. A, I was saying for for a singer, a lot of times a singer will want to take no part in like, oh hey, I I had no I had no um, part in creating that song. I don't want to do do a song by some other guy that you know wrote it. But so I, I think that that's cool because you know even though somebody else may have um, played a role in creating the song, he was originally there to create. Um, he can take it like you said and kind of create, uh, make it his own creation and you know put his oh, talent on it. And, and, and believe me. Yeah. It sounds so much better with Roy singing it than it did with me singing it on the demos. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you know, you're a guitar player, and that's yeah. yeah. But um, you know, and then Ty Ty Sims, of course, you know, yeah. he put you know a beautiful big bow yeah. on it and just made the thing with his mixing yeah. and mastering just made things sound uh, just out of worldly. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing what that man can do, you know, behind yeah. a mixing board. And, and so, um, obviously, you're the you know you're the main uh, songwriter and guitar player in the band. But I was curious. Um, how do you feel about like have you ever um, played with another guitar player in any of your previous bands? Not since like uh, not since my late teens, early twenties, man. Is that just because um, when you have it's always kind of been a headache? If you know what I mean, or it's just no, either? no, no, not at all. Actually, um, I, I I welcome it. Uh-huh. I mean that would bring Steel City from a five piece to a six piece. Oh wow! Okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> there you kind go. Of large. That, that explains but... that. Yeah. No, not at all, man. You know, like, uh, you know, I, I think all, you know, if anything, it would thicken the sound. Yeah. And, um, you know, it would allow for a lot, it could allow for a lot more musical diversity. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's yeah. a, there's another band that, uh, that, uh, you know, I'm friends with, and it's called, the band's called Wild America. Okay. And, you know, these guys are fantastic. And the, their, their lead guitar player, Billy DiNapoli, is has probably very quickly become one of my best friends. Oh wow, that's and cool. you know he and I have talked on occasion about mm-hmm. doing things like we may be doing something together, wow. and it's just it, hold on a second. Yeah, sure, I sure. Lost you. That's all right. I... But and that that would sound fantastic. Yeah. If it were to come about, just hasn't it hasn't worked out. But you know things like that. If that if opportunities like that came about, dude, dude. I jump on. Yeah, that, that's that's interesting. I think you know yeah. again adding another musician, yeah. adding a quality yeah. musician. It can only make things better, and I don't care if the guitar player is, you know, worlds better than me because yeah. we can all because he can learn from me and I can learn from him. I mean, you know, there, there is the other extreme. Like, um, as much as I uh, love Guns and Roses, you know, the um, current incarnation, like Axl Rose, um, he's got three or four different keyboard players, and you know, how many sax players up on stage? But you know, there, so there's the other extreme. But um, every, everybody, everybody to his own. You know, that, that's what I say, and. Um, you know, the only band that's kind of ever kind of been crazy enough to do anything like that. I mean, there's plenty of two guitar player band, but um, Iron Maiden, like um, for the simple fact that um, when when uh, their old guitar player Adrian Smith came back to the band, they didn't want to throw the guy out that you know took his place. So they they just said, okay, we'll be a three guitar band now. Hey, yeah, yeah. You know, and if it, if it works, yeah, and yeah. If it works and they sound fantastic, then yeah. that's all that really matters because yeah, you're just yeah. really trying to give you know. You're trying to give the music justice, and you're trying right. to, you know, make sure that the people that are coming to see you have a whole hell of a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, and, and I don't know how big of an Iron Maiden fan you are, but um, just in case, you know, we were talking about Richie Kotzen. I've been reading that um, Adrian Smith, the guitar player from um, Iron Maiden and Richie Kotzen, they got some kind of project going that they're, they've been recording. <laughs> that ought to oh, be wow, awesome. that's cool. Yeah, that, yeah. and I got to yeah, tell you, for, uh, yeah, before we wrap this up, my friend, um, one of the songs I really loved on your, um, well, actually, two, two parts, uh, one is Steal Your Heart, the other is Little Love. Oh, okay, yeah. 
Um, it's funny because people think because of the name A Little Love, people uh-huh. kind of feel it's a cover because I think there's been other songs named that. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, well, again, <laughs> you know, there's only so many notes and there's only so many words. But um, that's, that's a really cool song. I yeah. dig it. And uh, Seal Your Hearts probably was, uh, you know, that's a song that we probably will end up incorporating into our live set at some point yeah, or that, another. Yeah, I could see... I could see um yeah, you know, going to see a band and that song being one of the ones in the set, you know. Um, but Little Love, yeah, I can't, you know, the, the the name of the band or of artist is escaping me, but see, that's the first thing I thought of because before I even played the track, um, I've heard another, i heard a song called Little Love by somebody else. It's, it's escaping me right now, but um, yeah, that's, that's interesting that a lot of people have been asking me about that. <laughs> cool story, if you don't mind, about the, about the Steal Your Heart song. Uh-huh. You know, everybody always asks how you write, how, you know, I write music. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes, you know, the music comes first, uh-huh. sometimes the lyrics. That is the only song, because I'm not, like, the guitar solo for me is usually the last thing in the world that I think uh-huh. of, honestly. Because you figure, you know what, mm-hmm. when you get to that point, you'll write something in there that fits. Yeah. You know, and it doesn't have to be the guitar hero, bravado. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know. That song actually started with the guitar solo. That's, believe it or not because it was just something that I had in my head yeah. and I'm like it would, and, and then I thought you know it would be really cool to build around this and that's wow. how it happened now, now you ever, have the, you ever the, the bridge wow that's interesting and, yeah. and then I borrowed the lyrics from a song that I wrote in 1990 wow 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 so, yeah but it's it, it's like the craziest way I've ever written a song yeah, have you ever had like a title in your head like a uh, someone was ended up being like a song title you write the song you know around or a lyrics around the title you know, yeah, you, oh, that, you mentioned it, A yeah. Little Love, I kind of did it there, uh, um, it, and it, that happens, I, you yeah. know, from time to time, you know, the title comes in there, a lot of time you get um, a hook that way or too something, little, too yeah. late, yeah. you know, off, off the Fortress album, Too Little Too Late was like that, Passing Ships, yeah. kind of the same thing, um, it, you know, but like I said, each, each songwriting yeah. experience is a little bit different. Yeah, and it, sometimes yeah. you just have to find the right words to yeah. go along with those cool riffs that you, that, you know, yeah. or what you think are cool riffs. And of course, when you, when you get in there, you're, you're first getting in that songwriting mode, a lot of time you're just, I know, um, riffing. And, and like you said, like a lot of people, you know, you could probably just get in there and you could come up with the hottest sounding solo or riff. But um, what I notice in listening to your album is um, they're great songs. I mean, um, it, it's not so much about being a flashy lead player. It, it, it fits the song great, but... Um, like like I, I pay t- a lot of attention to um, you know the tone of your of your songs and the the lyrics. I was listening to the lyrics a lot, and so um, again I think that's what makes a great song. That you know um, if, the, if you can kind of take the listener on a musical journey. So I, I was kind of curious as a songwriter, even just a musician, um, how did you how did you get to the point where you're able to kind of um, put your ego aside as far as I don't have to you know. You know, solo solo at twenty on every track. You know, and show what a flashy player I am. Because because that's I know a lot hard for a lot of people to do. But I listen to your album and and like everything you do on there just fits the music. It fits the song. Oh well, thank you. I, yeah, I yeah. appreciate that. That's yeah. that's, uh, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, honestly, man, I think it's because it goes back to something that we kind of touched on mm-hmm. earlier. I really am more concerned about the songwriting yeah. than anything else because the song is going to tell a story, whether it's through mm-hmm. the music of the song or the lyrics of the song. They kind of blend together to tell that story. The, the guitar solo is simply an accent piece. Yeah, yeah. And some songs, some songs, like, yeah. you know, um, like in Give It Back, for instance, they're yeah. going to call for like the whole guitar hero bravado because it fits what, it they're fits doing. there. Yeah, yeah. Songs like, songs like Still Close, Still, you know, mm-hmm. Still Close to My Heart, Aren't gonna, they aren't gonna need that because that's not what the song yeah, calls for. Yeah. That song it wouldn't really fit there. Calls for like a very Boston-y yeah. type sound, yeah, yeah. If, so to speak. And yeah. it just you kind of pick what's best and you set your ego aside because the second you're letting your ego dictate what you do yeah. on an album, the album's gonna suck. And that doesn't matter if you're the guitar player, yeah. if you're the you know if you're the bass player that's just you know like riffing way yeah. too much, and, you know, instead of keeping good. A good uh, you know rhythm section tight with the drummer, yeah. the singer you know doing acrobatics yeah. doesn't need to be there. All you know, everybody kind of has to know you know what fits best, and that's one of the most beautiful things that I think that like I said, I've had the great fortune of 
fantastic musicians in the last iteration of Steel City and in the current iteration of the band. Wow. These guys are all pros. They know what fits. And, you know, they, they do their best to, to bring out the best in the song. And for that, I can't be more thankful. Oh, that, that, you know, and again, yeah, production-wise, yeah. same thing. That's great. Yeah. And, you know, uh, one song, when, when I talk about riffing, that um, comes to mind is, um, and this is a classic one, um, we're talking about Deep Purple. Smoke on the water. I mean, if if you listen to that track, Monster Riff just goes all the way through that track. It's one of the most memorable riffs you're ever going to hear. And, and interesting enough, I, I hear people always saying that um, guitar players sure that are just starting out, guitar. they want to either learn Smoke on the Water or Stairway to Heaven. I don't know why that is. Maybe as a guitar player, you can tell me, but um, <laughs> that that's the case. You know. I think again, it's just simply because it's a memorable riff. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's just something that echoes in your mind. Yeah. Uh, you know, kind of like, um, you know, one of my favorite 70s bands is Bad Company. Oh, great. Kind of like, ro like rock and roll fantasy, just kind of, the second you yeah. heard that, you know, that that opening riff, yeah. that ballsy little riff in yeah. E, you're just like, this, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do with my life. Yeah, yeah. Another, another song that hits me like that is, um, and it's a very different uh, sounding song, is... Um, uh, Another one bites the dust by Queen. I mean, the, just I'm not even talking yeah. about the guitar riff. I'm talking about the bass riff. The bass is, riff, yeah. All, all through that yeah, track, that's, <laughs> yeah. And, it, and the thing is, is that bass riff is timeless, uh, but it was perfect for its time. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it fit 1980, 1981. And I remember yeah. back then when when people um, when the song was just being released and that, and it started getting all over radio. Um, people weren't sure. For, wait, is, is this a disco song? Is this a R&B song? Is this a dance track? What is it? <laughs> you know, it's kind, of, it's kind of a mix of everything, yeah, and that's yeah. one of the beautiful things about Brian May. That's yeah, a guy yeah. that can play anything and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. Know? So true. So. And I think that's part of the reason a band like Queen has been able to carry on with um, like Adam Lambert because Queen, Queen at this point is more than just um, a great rock band. They got a great legacy. I mean, many of if you can get a decent enough. Um, guy to front the band and, and do the singing like Freddie um, that vote that catalog of music that Queen music is like a catalog it's um it's a soundtrack to so many people's lives that it's not even funny you know mm -hmm. yeah. you can't buy nostalgia my friend yeah yeah and it, it, at this point I think it's a little more than um, nostalgia you know what I mean um, people just yeah. love to hear that but um so, so um, I want to thank you once again, Mike, for taking time to talk to me, um, and I'll let you know no, when the thank interview you for goes up. Out and, you know, yeah. thanks, thanks for doing this for me, for not only for me but for the band. Oh, I appreciate it. Anytime. In fact, that's what I want to say. Let's um, let's keep in touch, and anytime you have anything to promote, um, feel free to reach out to me, and and we will do it again. And um, final question I like to ask a lot of people um, mm -hmm. is um, we talked about some of your influences, some of your favorite bands. Um, is there an album or a band that kind of you would say really influenced you, especially an album you could kind of point to and say that's that's one of the albums that really had a major influence on me that has a lot to do with what I'm doing today? Mm. You know, there's a few. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, I could of course, and you know, everybody, you know, people that know me know that I'm a massive, massive Kiss fan. Oh, I wow. love Striper. Oh wow. Uh, you know, Boston. Those bands are all there. Yeah. But, you know, um, gosh, man. I'm gonna go a little off the. I'm gonna okay, sure. Go uh, off the beaten path for me, so okay, to speak. Okay. Evolution by Journey. Oh wow, that's that's interesting. So so you, you know what's interesting? Uh, you tell me that uh, one of these guys was busting your chops that hey you sound your album sounds like Neil Sean. Well, isn't that a natural evolution? That's he's obviously influenced you. And let, let's be honest, Journey has influenced how many um, great great musicians over the years. I mean, mm -hmm. they've got a great body of work themselves. I mean. They, they they got some great rock and tunes. They they can do those great power ballads. They they can do it all, you know. Yeah, they can. <laughs> and um, I, I just um, again before we wrap this up because I got two more questions. Um, you mentioned Kiss, and I was reading today that um, Kiss Alive one today uh, being September tenth is the fortieth anniversary since that album was released. I mean that's quite a milestone. Um, how much since you're a Kiss fan, um, where does Kiss Alive one kind of um, where is it on your radar as far as being one of the great Kiss albums? <clears throat> well, to me, it, it, it's up there. Yeah. Um, and most definitely, Kiss Alive, the first Kiss Alive, yeah. um, you know, that was more or less a lot of people's introduction to the band because, yeah. you know, they, were, they really were kind of stagnant on Casablanca up yeah. to that point. Yeah. 
Yeah. But they weren't able to translate their live experience to the album. When they yeah, yeah. released that album, people just went crazy. Yeah, that I is, will tell yeah, you this much, though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm probably one of the few uh -huh. I'm a bigger fan of Kiss Alive too. Oh, interesting, interesting. Yeah, we, uh, I, I'd love to. I'd love to maybe interview you again and talk talk about that because, for a simple fact. Mike is. Um, I've been doing these interviews with people, and that's kind of why I asked you. Um, you know, what's what's you know one of your a couple of your favorite albums, and kind of talking in detail about okay, why were you so influenced by this album or this band? You know, but we could pick that up another time. And, and then the only other thing I want to ask you is, you mentioned Striper, and they're also one of my favorite bands. But I was kind of curious, you know, when Striper started, um, they they um, they were they had a bit of a heavy sound, and then over the years. They they um, they had some like to hell with the devil, which was a little more commercial, poppy sounding. And but lately on the like last three releases, they're almost full blown on metal. I mean, um, what do you yeah. think of the way the band has evolved? <clears throat> well, I think any band, unless you know, you say, I, yeah. people get mad sometimes yeah. when bands don't sound yeah. exactly like they sounded in the nineteen eighties. Yeah, For yeah. instance, there's a lot of people that love Europe. Yeah. Because of the because of the eighty sound and they don't like things that they've done Since, now, yeah, whether yeah. it's been from Start from the Dark, yeah, yeah. you know, War of Kings, whatever. Bands are going to evolve. Yeah. Members are you know, for the most part, yeah. now bands like Striper, you know, with the exception of, you know, yeah. Tim Gaines leaving yeah. and yeah. Harry Richardson taking his place, you know, bands, you know, they're gonna change members and yeah. you know, people, they're gonna evolve. It just depends. You know, do you dig what they're doing? Great. Go out yeah, by yeah, the, the reason it's great the reason I different. point to Striper is I tell you, I um, I've always been a Striper fan, and I probably would love anything they put out. But I tell you that they, um, I've just been so impressed with, um, especially the last three releases. They, um, a lot of pan uh, people at one point didn't think of Striper as a metal band. Well, Striper has proved they're um, they can go full blown on metal. They got the goods, you know. They they just released a new album last week, um, and I tell you. Um, it is it is full blown on metal, but but you know more more power to them. You know they're they're kind of proven they still got what it um, takes to crank out um, you know new music, and, and that that's that's the final thing I'm going to say, say to you, Mike, today in regards to a lot of guys that have been on the scene like you and been doing this for a while. Um, kind of just get to the point where who's buying CDs or going to live off uh, what I've done in the past. I dig the fact that um, you know you're still creating new music with uh, Steel City. Um, because there are a lot of bands, there are a lot of bands these days. Oh, got to worry about COVID nineteen. We're not gonna, we can't tour, so we're not gonna b bother releasing any new music or anything like that. Well, it's it's nice every once in a while to still have a band that puts out new music. So so thank you for that. <laughs> well, you're, you're welcome, and I want to thank everybody that's actually taking the time to support Steel City, whether it's listening to us on Spotify, you know, uh, spreading the word about the band, mm -hmm. you know. However, it, you know, however people have supported us, mm -hmm. I just want to extend a, a you know, a huge mm -hmm. heartfelt thank you to everybody who has, because without you know people you know digging the band, yeah. we wouldn't be doing it at all. Well, 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 and yeah. to, to the musicians who don't want to create right now, I just say now's the best time. This yeah. is where you're going to have the most captive audience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Well, Mike, I, I just got to say you gave a great interview today, and I I, I know people are going to enjoy this when we um, post this. Well, I'm definitely going to uh, keep in touch with you, and and. and and if you want, we definitely do this again. Uh, and I just got to tell you, Mike, Absolutely. you gave a great interview, and I want you to know I think you are the perfect person to be the spokesperson for your band because, I mean, oh, thank you. again, you, you just did a great job of telling the story today, and, and so I'm glad we uh, were able to allow you to do that. Can't wait for people oh. to hear this. So, so thank you, my friend, and I'll be in touch. <clears throat> okay, thank you so much. Thank you for the privilege. Okay, bye-bye. Take care.